Welcome. Today we're going to learn about a theorem uh, that will relate to critical points and helps us understand and determine their existence. And that theorem is Rawls' theorem. Suppose f of x is continuous on a, b, so continuous on the uh, closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, and f of a equals f of b. Then there's at least one point c between a and b such that f prime of c equals zero. So in other words, if you have a continuous differentiable function and um, that is um, restricted on an interval and the value of those two endpoints are exactly the same, someplace your derivative has to equal zero. Right? So here notice that uh, f of a is equal to f of b. Right? To get back to f of to get back to that same value, right? I had to turn around. Right? And in this case, we turned around twice. So there are, in this particular example, there are two places where the derivative is equal to zero. Right? So uh, it doesn't tell us how many, but it tells us there's at least one. Let's look at some more examples. So this is in your notes. Right? And you should add the, um, the, the part that I have written in there. All right, so let f be a function that satisfies the following three hypotheses. f is continuous on the closed interval, f is differentiable on the open interval, and f of a equals f of b. Then there is a number x equals c in a and b such that f prime of c equals zero. So Rawls theorem doesn't tell us how many times f prime of x equals zero, just that f prime of x equals zero at least once between a and b, provided that we've met the requirements, right? And, there, and you, you must show that those three requirements have been met. So let's look at the first example, all right? So here are some functions that satisfy all three hypotheses, right? So let's just call this one number one, all right? So here we can see that f of a does equal f of b. And matter of fact, we don't have just one place on that interval where um, the derivative is equal to zero, but everywhere, right? So f everywhere our derivative equals zero, because this is a constant function, right? So of course the derivative is going to equal zero. Oops, that should be, that, that should be a w, sorry. There we go. Let's look at the second example. Right? And again, continuous, differentiable, oh, you know, let me mark the endpoints here. Right? So there's our, there's our restricted interval. Uh, on the second one, here's our restricted interval. Right? And notice that f of a does equal f of b. Right? It's continuous and differentiable everywhere. So here we have one place. Right? So one place where the uh, derivative is equal to zero. So right here, f prime of c equals zero. And in this case, that happens to be a relative max. Let's look at the third example. Oops, I gotta erase that. All right, so here, f of a equals f of b. Oops. Right, and that is continuous on the interval between a and b, continuous and differentiable. And here we have two places. Right, so f prime of c1 equals 0, and f prime of c2 equals 0. Uh, and then here we have a relative max. Here we have a relative min. And in the last example, right, here's our closed interval, right, continuous differentiable on that interval. And we have one place where f prime of c equals 0. Oops, where's my prime? There we go. Let me write that a little bit nicer. And in this case, it happens to be a relative min. All right, so here are four instances where the requirements for Rawls theorem have been met, right? and uh, each one of them has at least one place where the derivative equals zero in that interval. All right, so let's do a few examples. All right, so and let's go over the requirements again. 
All right, so uh, by the way, I did mark all the pages that are in your notes. Almost all of this is in your notes. Rawls theorem only applies to a function which has been restricted within an interval. There are endpoints, and the value of the endpoints must be the same. You may have to restrict the interval yourself. Just find two values of x, a and b, where f of a equals f of b. In other words, it, in other words the difference between f of a and f of b will be zero. And I'll show you how to do that. So using Rawls theorem, step number one, check that the function is continuous on the closed interval. Step number two, check that the function is differentiable on the open interval. Step number three, check that f of a equals f of b. Step number four, take the derivative of the function and set it equal to zero. And by the way, if any part of, st of step one, two, or three have not been met, then you cannot apply Rawls theorem. But if, a, if uh, all the steps from one through three have been met, then you can take the derivative of the function and set it equal to zero. Solve for the value of x such that f prime of x equals zero, and then verify that c is between a and b. And it could be that you have more than one c, uh, and so long as they're in the interval, include those values. If they're outside the interval, don't include those values, because that value wouldn't be guaranteed by Rawls theorem. All right, this one is in your notes, and it's all written in there, so. I didn't see any point in erasing. I'm just going to add one thing, though. Determine if Rawls theorem applies. If so, find the values of x equals c guaranteed by the theorem for f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared on negative 2, 2. Note, even though we were given an open interval, when the theorem is invoked, we must check the conditions on the closed interval. So you have to make sure that it's continuous on the closed interval. All right, so first of all, we're going to check that the function is continuous on the closed interval, and then that the function is differentiable on the open interval. Well, this is a polynomial function, and we know that polynomial functions add this to your notes. Are continuous and differentiable everywhere. So if they're continuous and differentiable everywhere, they're certainly continuous and differentiable on the interval. Oops, can I put that in there? Uh, we'll just write differentiable on the next line. Not enough space to fit that word in. Oops. Oh, I'm missing an I. There we go. So now let's check that f of a is equal to f of b. We plug in negative 2, we plug in 2, and lo and behold, we get 8. So f of a does equal f of b. Right. So now we're going to set the, we're going to uh, take the derivative and set it equal to 0 because we're looking for horizontal tangent lines. All right, so just a power rule, exponent moves in front, reduce the exponent by 1. So f prime of x is 4x cubed minus 4x, set that equal to 0. All you got to do is factor out greatest common factor. When you do that, you've got 4x times x squared minus 1 equals 0. Actually, I had a little arrow here just so I could point. There we go. I'm down here. And x squared minus 1 as a difference of squares. That factors to x minus 1 and x plus 1. So here we have three solutions. x equals 0, x equals negative 1, x equals 1. All three of those are within the interval. So... There is, therefore, is a horizontal tangent exists when x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals negative 1. There's a relative extreme value for the function when x is 0, x is negative 1, and x is 1. Right? So all three of those are, um, satis sat are uh, x equals c, guaranteed by Rawls' theorem. Now, notice I just said it's a relative extrema. We don't know if it's in relative max or relative min. We would have to figure out... Um, the sign of values on either side of those, va of those um, x values to know whether it was a relative max or relative min. And, but that is for a later lesson. So here, we are just looking for those horizontal tangent lines. We're not determining whether they're relative max or relative min. Uh, and we're determining whether or not we could use Rawls' theorem uh, to find them. All right, here's our next one. Given f of x equals 3x squared minus x cubed, Show Rawls' theorem applies to 0, 3. All right, again, this is another polynomial function, and we know polynomial functions are continuous and differentiable everywhere. So therefore, they're continuous and differentiable on the interval. Yeah. 
I right, check uh, check that f of a equals f of b. All right, so a is zero, b is three. F of zero is three times zero squared minus zero cubed, which is zero. And f of three is three times three squared minus three cubed, which is three squared is nine times three is twenty-seven. Three cubed is twenty-seven, and that is indeed zero. So f of 0 does equal f of 3, right? So f of a equals f of b. Let's take the derivative and set that equal to 0. Right? Another power rule, right? So f prime of x equals, we got 3 times 2, which is 6. Reduce the exponent by 1, so that's 6x, minus, move the exponent in front, and then reduce the exponent by 1, 3x squared. We'll just factor out, we'll set it equal to 0. Uh, I'll just put it here. 0 equals 6x minus 3x squared. We can factor out greatest common factor, which would be a 3x. So that would be 2 minus x, and then we'll set that equal to 0. So if 3x equals 0, x is 0. And if 2 minus x equals 0, Right, subtract 2, divide by negative 1, or 2 minus what would it be 0? Right, that would be 2 minus 2. So x is equal to 2. Right, so uh, x equals 0 is an endpoint, so that's not a value guaranteed by Rawls' theorem. But x equals 2 is. Right, so therefore, a horizontal tangent exists when x equals 2. There is a relative extreme value for the function when x equals 2. Right, so that's a critical point that's guaranteed by Rawls' theorem because we're looking at a closed interval here. All right, let's look at another one. If you're not given an interval, set function equal to zero and solve for x. So the easiest way to do this is set it equal to zero and find two x-intercepts because you'll be guaranteed that f of a will equal f of b, which is going to be zero because right, there's going to be x-intercepts. Right, we're given the function g of x equals 4x to the 2 thirds power minus x squared. Find a value of c that satisfies Rawls' theorem. All right, so let's set this equal to 0. And this is kind of an interesting one. I've solved it in different ways. Um, I think, because notice I don't, I mean, it's not the night, I mean, like x to the 2 thirds and x squared. You know, it's not as clear. What is the greatest common factor I should pull out? Um, but I think, I think you will be okay with how I decide to solve it. All right, so 0 equals 4x to the 2 thirds minus x squared. All right, I decided to just move the x squared and raise it to a power. It just seemed cleaner. And the power I need to raise it to, I want to get rid of the radical. That seems to be the most important thing. Right? So if I, I'd prefer x to be not to the 2 thirds power, but to the first power. And I'm going to raise both sides to the same thing. The power I should raise it to is the 3 halves. Right? So if I have x here, if I have x squared to the 3 halves power, when you raise power to a power, you multiply exponents. So that's x to the 2 times 3 halves power. That's an exponent there. And so the, the 2's will cancel. That ends up being x cubed. Be nice if it stayed where I wanted it to stay. Let's do the same thing over there. Now, when you raise a, um, a product to a power, you have to raise each of the parts to that power. So we have equals. We have 4 to the 3 halves power, and then x to the 2 thirds raised to the 3 halves power. All right, so the reason I chose to do it this way is because I had 4 raised to a nice power. Um, when, I tried to, when I just pulled out a greatest common factor, although I end up with the same number, I had 4 raised to kind of a messy power. All right, so this would be equals. 4 to the 3 halves power is the same as the square root of 4 cubed. And then this would just be an x. Right? 
2 thirds times 3 half is 1, which is I wanted to get rid of the radical part. All right, so square root of 4 is 2, and that would give us 2 cubed, which is 8. So now I have x cubed equals 8x. That's not a great way to have this. Let's just move the 8x back. And you might be thinking, why did I move it and then move it back? Because so I could raise each side to the same power, get rid of the radicals. It just seemed cleaner in this, uh, this way. Now, I could have decided to pull out x to the 2 thirds power. That also worked, but it, it gave me a really messy coefficient. There, this one isn't so bad. All right, we'll factor out the greatest common factor, even though I'd get the same answer. This way, this didn't seem as bad to me. We'll factor out the x. We've got x squared minus 8. It is a difference of squares. So it ends up being x times x minus the square root of 8, x plus the square root of 8. All right, so that means we've got three values here, x equals 0, x equals the square root of 8, and x equals negative square root of 8. We'll check that f of a equals f of b, all right? So why don't we choose the three that are far, the two that are farthest apart, the square root of 8 and the square root, negative square root of 8. And if you don't like that, you can take the 0. All right, so first of all, let's check that it's continuous uh, and differentiable before we find f of a equals f of b, although we did go through a whole lot of work to find the values of a and b. Uh, so it is continuous. Polynomial and cubic functions are continuous everywhere. Polynomial function, uh, polynomial or differentiable anywhere. The cube root is not differentiable at x equals 0. All right, so uh, if we make that an endpoint, it doesn't have to be differentiable, right? So let's th rethink that. Let's not take the uh, square root of 8 and negative square root of 8. Let's take 0 in the square root of 8, right? So it wouldn't have taken us too long to figure out, uh-oh, we have a problem, right? We don't want to choose the, um, the negative square root of 8 and the square root of 8 because we would have a problem with the... Um, with, with zero, right? Because we're not differentiable at zero, right? So it would be very bad to choose. We couldn't use Rawls theorem, right? If we um, if we're di not differentiable somewhere, but it doesn't matter about the endpoints. So automatically, x equals zero has to be an endpoint. Has to be one of our values, right? So that's why before we we think about which f, which we got three values there, uh, which th which two of those to use, we went back and and stopped and thought a moment. Make sure we're continuous and differentiable in whatever inter interval we choose. So we don't want 0 in the interval. Let's have 0 be an endpoint. So let's take 0 in the square root of 8, because I'd rather have positive square root of 8 than negative square root of 8. So g of 0 is going to be 4 times 0 to the 2 thirds power minus 0 squared, which is 0. Uh, sorry, nobody in there. Okay. Please, when you do finish, can I lock the doors? Okay, sure. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Couldn't do anything about the interruption. Um, and I can't pause the tape. So let's take g of the square root of 8. So that would be 4. And I'm going to rewrite that 2 thirds as the cube root squared. All right, so yeah, when you have an ex a rational exponent, and that, that just means an exponent that's a fraction, it's power over root, right? Power over root. So this would be 4 times the cube root of 8 squared minus the square root of 8 squared. So this would be 4 times the cu uh, cube root of 8 is 2, and 2 squared is is 4. So we have, wait a second, did I, I just checked this. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, I just, I swear I just checked to make sure that our endpoints worked. Did I write down anything wrong? So it was 4 times the cube root.
squared minus the square root of 8 squared. No. I'm going to do exactly the same way. I just did it to make sure. And then, and then I'm going to have to look for mistakes. If I made a mistake, the 0 is fine. Let's try the square root of 8. All right, so 4. So this is the square root of 8. I could rewrite that as 4 times 8 to the 1 half power all raised to the 2 thirds power. And we multiply exponents when we raise power to a power. Yeah, I think I put maybe something in the wrong. Minus, and then it was the square root of 8 squared. All right, so the 2's will cancel. So it ends up being, OK, good. I must have wrote something down wrong. 4 times the cube root of 8. I think I neglected, oh, I know what I did. It's, I, I totally left off, I, I treated the square root of 8 as 8 when I rewrote it as opposed to square root of 8. It's a good thing I rewrote that. Minus, and then the square and square root cancel, that would be 8. The cube root of 8 is 2. 4 times 2 is 8. Phew! We have 8 minus 8, which is 0. So good. f of 0 equals f of the cube root of 8. Right. So before, I accidentally plugged it in as 8. That's why I wasn't getting the same answer. Not square root of 8. Right. So, but now it's OK. Take the derivative, set the function equal to 0. So we have uh, g prime of x equals, we have 2 thirds times 4x, and then 2 thirds minus 3 thirds would be negative 1 third minus 2x. So this would be 8 over 3, and this is the cube root of x. Okay, so that, that goes to the denominator. Minus 2x, let's set that equal to 0. So we have 0 equals 8 over 3 cube roots of x minus 2x. Add 2x to both sides, so you can cross, cross multiply. So 2x equals 8 over 3 cube roots of x. So now let's cross multiply. Okay, I think that is a 1. So we have, oh, and I could, if I wanted to, reduce in the numerator. As long as I don't reduce any x's, it wouldn't make a difference if I canceled out, if I divided both sides by 2. I think I'll just leave it, though. 8 equals, and then we have 6. So you see I'm going to divide by 2 right away. Uh, 6, and then, so that would be x times x to the 1 third. When you multiply um, x's, you add the exponents, right? So 1 plus a third is x to the 4 thirds. Right? And then let's divide both sides by 6. I want to get rid of the, that coefficient altogether. Right? So that gives us 4 thirds. equals x to the 4 thirds power. That's interesting. Raise both sides to the 3 fourths power. Oh, and this is not pretty. So this is called, check in a calculator that it's between 0 and the square root of 8. All right, so we have x equals 4 thirds to the 3 fourths power. I ain't going to simplify. So let's, I got a calculator handy. Let's make sure that that is indeed between. So 4 divided by 3, and then we'll raise that to the 3 divided, or I just put 0.75 in there. 0.75 power. Oops, <laughs> doesn't help if you raise it to the 75th power.
didn't hit the point, the decimal point hard, uh, well enough. So 0 0.12408. I'm going to write it as the exact value, but let's just double check. I am fairly certain that that, yes, that is definitely less than the square root of 8, right? Because the square uh, root of 8 uh, is just a little less than 3, right? Because the square root of 9 would be 3. Actually, it's the square root of 2, I think, is 1.4. So that is definitely in between. So we, we're going to verify, but we're good. 0 is definitely less than 4 thirds to the 3 fourths power, which is less than the square root of 8. So not pretty values, but doesn't matter, right? We were still able to find it using Rawls' theorem, right? So... We, have, we would have a relative extrema there um, at, or at least we'd have a horizontal tangent line, whatever it is, we're definitely having a horizontal tangent line right, at, um, at 4 thirds to the 3 fourths power. I won't guarantee it's anything other than a horizontal tangent line. At three, uh, no, four thirds to the three fourths power. Right. That was the hardest one, I think, in this whole set. All right, let's continue on. All right, so uh, I'll try to make it not so difficult to solve. So here, if you understood this one, this is about as difficult as, it gonna, as it's going to be. Sometimes one of the requirements for Rawls' theorem is not met, and therefore Rawls' theorem cannot be applied to identify relative extrema. Right? And the examples are in your notes. Explain why Rawls' theorem does not apply for f of x equals the square, excuse me, the absolute value of x minus 4 on 2, 5. Right? So if you think about what absolute value looks like, it looks like a v, right? and it's vertex is going to be at 4, 0. I mean, just like vertex form for quadratics, right? So uh, it's shifted 4 to the right. And right? so if it says x minus 4, that's 4 to the right. And nothing is added, so it's 0. So 4, 0, there's a corner. That's not differentiable, right? That's why I did not use 0. I did not use negative square root of 8 and square root of 8 on the, the last problem, right? Because I realized, whoops, wait, wait, wait. Wouldn't be differentiable at 0, right? So I can... We can use Rawls' theorem, just not on this interval, right? Uh, and actually, if we didn't use it on this interval, we couldn't use it at all, because the problem would be uh, f of a would not equal f of b anywhere else. So Rawls' theorem just could not be used for this, this equation at all. all right, so uh, in order for Rawls' theorem to be applied, f needs to be differentiable on the open interval, 2, 5. At x equals 4, this absolute value function is not differentiable since there is a corner or a cusp in the graph. Right? So vertex of absolute value functions can't be in the interval for Rawls' theorem to apply. Right, back here, um, we didn't have a corner. We had a vertical tangent. Right? So um, right here, you can write vertical tangent. Oops. Oh, great. Just drop the eraser. Right, so that's why zero had to be an endpoint. All right, let's continue. All right, explain why Rawls' theorem does not apply for f of x equals cotangent x divided by 2 on pi 3 pi. Well, it makes it nice and easy to figure out with a nice pretty graph, but I also have an explanation that you can add to your notes. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals 2 pi, and therefore it is not differentiable at this point. Therefore, Rawls' theorem does not apply. This is not continuous. Your function has to be continuous. All right, so let's add to this not continuous. The other one was not differentiable in the interval. This one's not continuous on the interval. And we can see here why. So 
if we think about it, cotangent is, is adjacent over opposite. Um, right here is, we want f of 2 pi. Right? So cotangent pi would not be defined, um, and neither would 2 pi. I don't know why I put pi, because we're looking at 2 pi. Pi was the endpoint, right? So uh, f of 2 pi would be cotan. Oh, that's right, because it was 2 pi divided by 2. Sorry. We have f of uh, 2 pi would be cotangent 2 pi divided by 2, which is cotangent pi. And we don't want the opposite side to be the y value to be 0. So cotangent pi is undefined. By the way, cotangent 2 pi also undefined. So, uh, we have lots of problems with this one. Determine whether Rawls theorem can be applied to f of x equals x squared minus 3x on 0, 3. If Rawls theorem can be applied, find all values of c in the open interval 0, 3. Now, I think that one had a little typo. <laughs> Pick an interval. 0, 3 such that f prime of c equals 0. I have to say I did not do the typing here. If Ross theorem cannot be applied, explain why. All right, so our interval is going to be 0, 3. I don't know what happened here. Um, we don't have a problem with continuity and differentiability, right, because this is polynomial function. And we know polynomial functions, so this is taking care of 1 and 2. Uh, polynomial functions, and when I say 1 and 2, I mean requirement 1 and 2. Polynomial functions are different, continuous and differentiable everywhere. So that's not a problem. Requirement number three. All right, so zero and three. So f of zero would be zero squared minus three zero, which is zero. f of three is three squared minus three times three. So that's going to be nine minus nine, which is zero. So f of zero equals f of three. So in other words, f of a equals f of b. So that's not a problem. So, we've met all three requirements. So, all three requirements for Rawls theorem are met, so let's just continue on. All right, so now we can find the derivative. So, we have f prime of x equals, so the derivative for x squared minus 3x would be 2x minus 3. All right, we'll set that equal to 0. All right, so uh, x equals 3 halves. All right, so that was easy. <laughs> and is 3 halves between 0 and 3? Yes, it is. Right, so we've met all the requirements, so therefore f prime of 3 halves, or I should say not f prime. f, let's just say f of x has a, I was going to say f prime of a, f prime of 3 halves equals 0. Yeah, that's true, but um, what I really want to say is f of x has a horizontal tangent line. At x equals 3 halves. Okay, this wasn't too difficult. And if I go too fast, you can pause the tape. And if you have questions, let me know. I was gonna, I'm trying to see if I can finish this in one take. I don't know. I may have to do two videos, but I'm pretty close to the end. Determine whether Rawls theorem can be applied to f of x equals x squared minus x over x 
a negative 1, 1. If Rawls' theorem can be applied, find all values of c in the open interval negative 1, 1, such that f prime of c equals 0. If Rawls' theorem cannot be applied, explain why. Well, we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Oh, you know what? I think I may have... Oh, I already wrote it in. <laughs> Save myself a little bit of trouble. There we go. Function is not continuous on the interval, negative 1, 1. There's an infinite discontinuity at x equals 0. Therefore, Rawls' theorem does not apply. There, save ourselves a little bit of time. All right, so you can add that to your notes, but you probably noticed right away that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, which is an infinite discontinuity. Determine whether Rawls' theorem can be applied to f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared on 2, 3. If Rawls theorem can be applied, find all values of c in the open interval, 2, 3, such that f prime of c equals 0. If Rawls theorem cannot be applied, explain why. I don't know if I used a... Oh. I didn't write it in. I want my writing. All right, so requirement number 1 and 2 have been met. All right, it's a polynomial function. Polynomial functions are continuous and differentiable everywhere. All right, so that's not a problem. All right, let's check requirement number three. F of two equals two to the fourth minus two times two squared, which is 16 minus 2 squared is 4, 2 times 4 is 8, so 16 minus 8 is 8. f of 3 is 3 to the 4th minus 2 times 3 squared, so that would be 81 minus 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. Oh, and 81 minus 18 is 63. Well, since f of 2 does not equal f of 3, Rawls theorem does not apply. Right? f of a did not equal f of b. And that was one of the requirements. The values of the endpoints have to be the same. So, we're done. All right, and this one I decided to save myself a little bit of time. I left it written up there. And this one is in your notes. Use Rawls' theorem for y equals negative 2 sine 2x on the interval negative pi, uh, negative pi to pi. Well, sine is continuous and differentiable everywhere, so that's not a problem, as you can see. Right, it's a nice little curve, you know. Does f of negative pi equal f of pi? Let's right, see if that one's met. All right, so if, ooh, come on, move it down. So we have negative two sine two times negative pi. That would be negative two sine negative two pi. Well, that's zero. It's just going around the circle the other way. Right? Whether I have sine 2 pi or sine negative 2 pi, that's 0. Negative 2 times 0 is 0. And then uh, f of pi would be negative 2 times sine 2 pi. Well, sine 2 pi is 0. Anything times 0 is 0. So we have met that. f of a does equal, does equal f of b. That requirement's been met. So now we can take the derivative and find the value of c, and I'm just going to move the whole thing. That is guaranteed by Rawls' theorem. All right, so uh, I'm going to take the derivative, and it looks like I didn't bother to write that there. <laughs> so f prime of x, all right, so we're taking the, actually, <laughs> for some reason I didn't, or I don't know if it got erased, but f of x is negative 2 sine 2x, f prime of x is what's below it. 
All right, so the derivative of negative sine blop, uh, negative 2 sine blop, is negative, uh, negative 2 cosine blop. The blop is 2x. The derivative of 2x is 2. So negative 2 times 2 would be negative 4. So negative 4 cosine 2x. We set it equal to 0. So we have 0 equals negative 4. Just going to move that up a little bit. Negative 4 cosine 2x. Divide both sides by negative 4. You got a 0 equals cosine 2x. Take arc cos of both sides. All right, so we have arc cos is 0 and arc cos of cosine 2x. Arc cos and cosine cancel each other out. So where is cosine 0? At pi halves and 3 pi halves, right, on the y-axis, where x is 0. So we have 2x is equal to pi halves and 3 pi halves. Divide both sides by 2. Right, and you'll have your answer. So pi halves equals 2x divided by 2. Pi fourths equals x. 3 pi halves equals 2x. Divide that by 2. You got 3 pi fourths equals x. Both of those are in the interval between negative pi and pi. So we're OK. We have two relative extrema guaranteed by Rawls theorem, pi fourths and 3 pi fourths. Two places where uh, in, on, the, on the interval where the derivative is going to be 0. And this is the end of my tape. Big takeaway, if, uh, if Rawls' theorem guarantees the existence of an extreme value in the interior, excuse me, Rawls' theorem guarantees the existence of an extreme value in the interior of a closed interval. Rawls' theorem guarantees there must be at least one point between A and B at which the derivative is 0. If and only if the three requirements for Rawls' theorem have been met. Number one, differentiable on the open interval. Number two, continuous on the closed interval. And number three, f of a equals f of b. In other words, the endpoints have the same value. Rawls' theorem is another way to check for extreme values. In the next lesson, we're going to learn a related theorem called mean value theorem. Thanks for watching.